This is our last uh, in this part in Matthew uh, for this year. Uh, we'll be looking at Matthew over the next four weeks and returning to our journey through Matthew next year uh, with Matthew 17. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bound on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. And he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed, be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. But he turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. I assure you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, as we said last week, the time of discernment is here. Uh, in Matthew's good news biography of Jesus. A discernment is the skill to make wise decisions in this world on the God-given evidence in front of you. Let me say that again. Discernment is the skill to make wise decisions in this world on the God-given evidence in front of you. Uh, it was a case last week, and it's to be discerning in regard to Jesus. Last week, we saw that there are attacks on that discernment, didn't we? We saw that there were three attacks, the danger of more, the distraction of the mundane, the destructive message. All of those take people away from seeing Jesus as he truly is. And Matthew doesn't ease up, does he? Discernment is still the key issue as he continues in his biography of Jesus. Jesus asks two questions. And as they open up his followers and respond to those questions, Jesus then talks to them about three consequences for true discernment about him. And we're going to look at them today. Let me pray. Our Father, thank you that your word speaks clearly. Thank you that it is living and active because you are living and active. And that is always the case with your word. Thank you that your word in the flesh was living and active in this world. And thank you that we have this good news biography to bring us face to face with him. Father, give us discernment and help us to understand the truly magnificent and costly consequences of knowing who Jesus is. In his name we pray. Amen. I look there in verse 13, I'm at point two on the outline. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And one of the things that I've really learnt in the last five or six weeks is how important geography is. I'm an art student by training or trade, depending on what you want to call it. So geography isn't one of my strong points. But I've really learnt a lot over the last few weeks about why geography is so important in this biography. You see, Jesus now moves about 30 to 40 kilometres north of where he was last week into an even more non-Jewish area. 
He's moved right up to the top border between Israel and the rest of the world. It's almost like he's saying, what I'm on about is on the border between all people. It's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles as well. And when he gets to that area, he asks his close followers a really important question. Uh, If we're talking about politics today, it'd be, what do the polls say about how people are receiving me? What do people say about me? And his disciples respond. Now, when you look at their answer there in verse 14, there's no doubt that people think he's significant. They even think he might be sent by God. They certainly look with favour upon him. And then Jesus asks his second question, doesn't he? Look there in verse 15. But you, he asks them, who do you say that I am? It's a sharp question, isn't it? It's even sharper when you realise that it's in the present tense. So it's always going to be in the present tense whenever people read the Bible, which means it's right in the forefront, which means it's not just for the disciples, it's for people who read the Bible in Narrabri today. Who do you say that I am? It's always in the present tense. What do you make of Jesus? Who do you say he is? And doesn't Peter knock it out of the park? Doesn't he just nail it there in verse 16? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter has just exercised brilliant discernment, hasn't he? On the basis of the God-given evidence in front of him, He has come to a wise conclusion. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, we know that, don't we? I mean, we say those words every week. We don't use them in normal conversation. They're a bit archaic, a bit dusty. But we know what they mean, don't we? Do we? Do we know what those words mean? how massive they are in their import and their significance for the whole world. I put simply, Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. They both mean anointed, someone who is chosen. Uh, In this context, they mean a bloke chosen by God to do a very particular job. Now, I want to just pause there because I want to just give us a very quick Cook's tour of why this is such an important term. And the first time this word is used in the whole Bible is Leviticus chapter 4, verse 5. It talks about a bunch of men, priests, who are set aside to do a job, to lead God's people as they related to God out here in the real world. The next reference is not until 1 Samuel 2.10. Uh, when a lady called Hannah sings a song about a boy she is hoping will grow up to be great. Uh, that boy's name was Samuel. And in that song, she mentions that God has a Christ, a Messiah, a king. A king who will have power over the whole universe. A king who is entrusted by God to both rule and judge the world. Uh, Right through 1 and 2 Samuel, that word, that title, Christ or Messiah, is always connected to the king. Uh, We know who the first king is, don't we? What was his name? His name was Saul. And in 1 Samuel 12, 3, he's described as the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. Doesn't do so good at his job, does he? Uh, God picks the next king. His name is David. And we recognise that name, don't we? It's in the first verse of this Good News biography, isn't it? Son of David. He's called anointed in 2 Samuel 23, verse 1. God makes a promise to David, if you know your Bibles, 2 Samuel 7. The word Christ or Messiah is not there, but the promise to David is that one of David's boys, one of his descendants through the pages of history, will rule the universe. Not just rule the universe, but rule it rightly. Restore it. Give it rest. In fact, he will be such a king that he will be God's boy as well. He'll be God's son. And those terms are all brought together in that poem that Phil brought us. Did you notice that? Psalm 2. That poem was sung at every coronation 
for the king of God's people as they lived in that bit of geography. And as that song was sung at the coronation of God's king, God says, that's my king. I put him there. That king has unrivaled power and authority over the whole universe. That's my boy. Did you notice that? That's my boy. He pleases me. He's enthroned. He has no one who can oppose him. And did you catch the last verse in Psalm 2? Anyone who takes refuge in him will be okay. Did you notice that that king was referencing that other reading we had in Isaiah 9? Did you notice that? Again, a boy in a world of darkness and he'll come in and as he comes into this world of darkness, I don't think it could have been darker on the night Jesus was born, could it? We think it's dark now. It's always been dark. And when that boy comes, light will pierce the world. And a reign will be established in a remarkable way and peace and restoration and wonder and magnificence will come into the world. And how will that happen? Did you catch that last verse in Isaiah 9 verse 7? Did you catch it? The zeal of God, God's enthusiasm will bring this about. Uh, The term's used again in the book of Isaiah, in a really remarkable way, in Isaiah 45 verse 1, where it actually talks about a bloke who's not a Jew, Cyrus, the Persian emperor. He's described as God's Messiah, God's anointed one, God's Christ, because he's got a job to do. He will send God's people back to their land. He will authorise them. He will finance them as they return and set up that temple again. And gee, it will be magnificent, won't it? No, it's not a massive disappointment. A failure. They weep. And we know there at the end of Isaiah that there's still this king to come, this boy from David's family who'll be God's boy. So when you open Matthew and you read that first verse, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, all your hopes start to rise, don't they? And then as it unfolds and you read that genealogy, you go, yeah, he's got the right family line. There's a few people there we don't agree with, but the good family line. And then the birth narratives and the coming out of Egypt, the quoting of Psalm 2 at his baptism, the way in which Jesus consistently says that his work is about refuge and restoration and healing and binding up and feeding and caring and all those exhibitions of divine power, you start to go, this could be the boy. This could be the boy. And unlike Australian cricketers who are called the next uh, Bradman, it's not too heavy for this boy, is it, this expectation? Because he just grows into it. And finally Peter discerns it. This will be the one. This is the one. This is the one who will restore the universe. This is the one who will be the king. This is the son of God, that God tapped and said, I've got a job for you. And it's not a dead promise. Did you notice the second part of that there in verse 16? You are the Messiah, the son of the living God, not a dead God, a living God. And finally Peter's nailed it. Jesus is the promised king of the world. And then we see what that means, don't we? Jesus unpacks what that means. You'll see it there on your outline. There are three consequences. There's a blessing, and I've always wanted to use this word in a sermon. There's a bamboozlement, and then there's the nature of following this king. Uh, Jesus' next words to Peter are, are not a question, are they? I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse 17. Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. On this rock I'll build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. And he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. We we dealt with this passage in our series at the start of the year, so I'm not going to unpack it like I did there. Uh, But what is Peter there? Did you notice what he is? He is blessed. If you remember back to our series on the Sermon on the Mount, that means he's approved by God. Two thumbs up. 
But do you notice that as Jesus unpacks that, unpacks that in terms of what he knows, unpacks it in terms of what community he's part of, unpacks it in terms of what power he has, Peter deserves none of it. It's not as if Peter sat down and opened the scroll of the Old Testament and wrangled out this knowledge. No, it was revealed by who? God. Not his grey matter. And as Jesus unpacks what it means to have this knowledge, do you notice what he talks about in terms of the community he's part of? Now, Peter didn't deserve that. God just said, you're in a mob. In fact, that mob is so significant that the gates of hell will not overpower it. Have you thought of that? The blue balls will disappear. Pony club will disappear. The Lions Club will disappear. Narrabri will disappear. The church will never disappear. It is here forever. And no amount of anti-discrimination tribunal decisions will ever wipe it from the face of the earth. It is permanent. And do you notice he's given immense power? (laughs) Did you see that? But you notice that it's already decided in heaven. What you do here, it's already decided there. Uh, If you want to summarise this blessing of Peter, it's grace, isn't it? He receives what he doesn't deserve in the mercy of God, knowledge, community and power. You are the object of the grace of this king and he gives you what you do not deserve. Well, Jesus' next words are not a question either, are they? I'm at point four on the outline, and they're certainly not a blessing. They are something that just completely throws Peter's brain. <laughs> Doesn't it? Look there in verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and raised on the third day. It is a necessity. That's the word must there. Did you see that word must? Very small Greek word, but wherever you see it, you know that this is just non-negotiable. It's not as if Jesus is sitting down with the 12 and going, hey, hey, fellas, uh, what what are our options here? Let's look how we can kind of leverage the poles into power. Some of Jesus' disciples were confirmed revolutionaries. Judas Iscariot and the two sons of thunder, they're blokes who like a fight. Their desire was to kill Romans. Jesus is not sitting down with them and going, hey, hey, gentlemen, how do we begin the guerrilla war? Jesus says, I must go to Jerusalem. And when I go there, I must be rejected. I must die. And I must rise. That's the way of the king. That's the way of the saviour of the universe. That's the true nature of kingship, isn't it? A king who gives himself for the good of his people. And as the rest of this book unfolds, because now we've dealt with who Jesus is, we're going to see what that means for the rest of this Good News biography. We'll see that a king like this does this to bind up the broken, to heal the hurt, to give rest to the restless, to find sheep that are lost and hungry and beset by dealing with sin. By dealing with sin. There is no other way. This is the way. And Peter, he is so throaty, he is so bamboozled. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, that, that's never going to happen to you. I can't believe it. I've backed the wrong horse. This isn't the option I got a horse, I got a sword, let's get a revolution going. That's really what he wants. Uh, That's really what Judas Iscariot wanted. That's really what the sons of thunder wanted. And that's why Jesus has to say, be quiet. That's why Jesus goes off alone when the crowd wants to crown him. Uh, That's why the Jewish literature at the time is looking for a revolution. Uh, I understand, Peter. He knows his true identity, but he's filled it with the wrong stuff. And Jesus has to rebuke him. 
he turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns but man's. Uh, Jesus uses almost exactly the same words he used in Matthew 4 at the temptation. Remember that? When he looked the devil in the eye and said, rack off. That's the same here. Same Greek words. Did you notice that Peter being bamboozled is not just a funny term? Did you notice what Jesus describes it as there? You are an offence to me. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? To get Jesus so wrong, to listen to the lie of the devil that says there is another way, to offer an alternative image of Jesus, to deny God's plans to deal with sin, such a thing is an offence to Jesus. And he exposes it for what it is. That will not work. That cannot work. A revolution will be a band-aid, but it will not heal the brokenness. Now, there's no denying that Jesus constantly bamboozles us, doesn't he? <laughs> I mean, the needs of others before my own, even the basic concept of grace, giving people what they do not deserve, they all bamboozle, don't they? But here is a very firm warning. It's not a harmless, laughable thing. It's to offend Jesus and to fall for a lie. Well, Jesus gathers the disciples in. Uh, Verse 24, I'm at point five on the outline to look at the third consequence of recognising him. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. Uh, What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father and then he will reward each according to what he has done. I assure you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, It's a famous passage, isn't it? And there's so much debate and argument about what taking up your cross means, when the Son of Man will come in glory, what it means not to die before we see. I I like to try and keep things simple. So let's just grasp it for what it is. This is what it looks like to follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to follow Jesus. Don't use weasel words. Don't use fakery. Pick up your cross and start walking in those very same footsteps. And when you pick up a cross, your life is not yours. It belongs to another boss. And when you pick up your cross, then you are the object of public ridicule and rejection. And when you pick up your cross, you are dead to the world. And when you pick up your cross, you are not concerned about your life, your public reputation, your standing in the community, your life goals and aspirations. You are concerned about putting your feet in the same footsteps. I think we've lost how bloody and blunt the cross is. It's become jewellery and church decoration instead of an instrument of death where a ruling power says you are mine, and you will be rejected. We've got to get the sharpness of what Jesus is talking about here. If you're going to follow him, you follow him exactly. He is your ruler, and his life is the template for yours. And he unpacks that clearly. Clearly, Life is gained by following him, coming after him. Life is gained by having him as king. Life is gained by bringing everything before Jesus and having him shape it. What benefit is there in the world if you have fine property, if you have great possessions, if your fame and your Facebook account are known by all, if you have degrees innumerable, if you have the right social standing, 
and you are buried in the dirt and you leave it all behind. What does it benefit you? If you have all that and you don't have Jesus. And he unpacks the time frame too, doesn't he? I'm coming back. I will return. And there will be a great accounting. Just look ahead. But let me tell you, and I think he's very clear about this. In a matter of days, you'll see me in all my glory. That's chapter 17. In a matter of months, you'll see me crowned on that very same cross I picked up for you. If you want to know what following me looks like, be there at Golgotha. To follow Jesus is to have life bound up in wholeness, rest, a shepherd, but it is to have a life that constantly asks, how is this shaped by the cross of Christ? The moment of discernment here. At the last point on the outline, the Good News biography has presented us such a clear picture of Jesus and that question there in verse 15, but you, who do you say that I am? How do you answer that? How do you answer that? Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he the ruler of the universe? who has come to bind you up and deal with your sin by living and dying and rising for you. Is that the Jesus you know? If it isn't, please get to know him. Spend time with him. Read one of these biographies. Sit with a friend who does know him and get to know this Jesus. If it is the Jesus you know, then let me just quickly unpack as a way of closing those consequences. To know Jesus is to be blessed. It's to be the object of God's grace, to receive what you don't deserve. And that's the flavour of the mob. It's to be part of a community gathered that will never be wiped out. It's to exist in a mob that walks through now and lives forever. It's to be granted access to the eternal in the dust of now. That bears deep consideration, doesn't it? It affects what we do. The great delight of gathering, non-negotiable, with this mob that will never be overcome because of the grace of God. That's to be blessed, isn't it? Uh, To know Jesus as he is is to be bamboozled. (laughs) Confronted, have your whole world turned upside down by a king who rules through a cross, by a tomb that is shut and now empty, by a God who lives eternal and takes on flesh to proclaim any other king is offensive. There is no other way that our brokenness will be dealt with. Be bamboozled, but come back to him time and time again. To know Jesus as he is, is to follow him. And Andrew was right. Verse 24 and verse 26 are so confronting. This is what it means to follow me, to deny your own claims to God's throne, to follow a king who gives up all his godness to die for us to gain anything else, to gain anything else is to gain a patch of dirt you'll be buried in. And that must grab all of our lives from the way we feed our desires and designs through magazines and Instagram to the aspirations we will set for ourselves in this world to the possessions and the property and the public reputation we pursue, to what absorbs our minds and our hearts and our hands and our attention and our focus. 
If we follow Jesus, this is the question, how does the cross shape this? They're the consequences. And let me close by saying to know Jesus as he is, to be blessed, to be bamboozled, to follow him, will only come through his word, won't it? Through his word, in his mob, and expressed in prayer. So let me do that now. Father, thanks for your word. We thank you that you sent your son who chose not to express his godness by grasping for a throne, but took on human flesh and gave himself for his enemies so that at the point of death, his perfect life and his perfect death paid for our sin and you raised him and seated him above every power so that we might know how glorious you are. Father, thanks for Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Help us to grasp the goodness of being blessed by knowing him, of being bamboozled by facing him, of the goodness of following him. Please help us to show this man to this town so that others may come to know him as he truly is. Amen. Any quick questions? Ros, yeah. Um, rejection is not just the hole in the ground. Yeah, Ros has picked up a very good point. Um, surely rejection is not just a hole, hole in the ground, but it has eternal consequences. It does. And those, there are so many threads in that section that we could pull out, aren't there? Uh, but if we reject him now, then our eternal consequence is a hole in the ground, and that's it. Uh, and not dwelling in the presence of God. So to put it bluntly, to reject him is hell. Uh, and, yeah, we, we could have explored that a bit more, but that's a good question to ask. There are eternal consequences to what we do with Jesus as he is in the Bible. Yeah.